Welcome all to this Dynamic Coalition webinar. We're very happy to have you here. And we have very, very distinguished guests with us and speakers. Um, so I'm giving the floor to you, Zeynep, for the official welcome. OK. Um, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a long, this is day four of Open Education Week. So I think some of you have been to a lot of these webinars and we're very uh, appreciative that you've come and taken your precious time to join us today. We're going to speak about the OER Dynamic Coalition. We have uh, some distinguished speakers, four distinguished, three distinguished speakers, four distinguished speakers. And uh, Monsieur Miguel Angel Pereira, Colin de la Ica, Jihan Osman and Cable Green. My colleague will be giving you a proper introduction and they will be presenting uh, on a number of different issues related to the OER Dynamic Coalition and the OER recommendation. And with that, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the framework of the OER Dynamic Coalition. So I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Okay, I hope you can see the screen. So the OER Dynamic Coalition, what is it and what are we talking about? First of all, for those of you who know UNESCO is, I'm sure you do, and if you've been to these other talks, you're probably tired of this shot, but just in case, it's the UN organization, it's, it's a specialized agency of the UN based in Paris with uh, 193 member states and field offices in 50 countries. We work everywhere except Antarctica, we're all over the place and we work at a global level. Where our work is based on UN commitments in terms of that, uh, specifically the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 19 and 26, 19 being about the right to impart and receive information through any media regardless of frontiers, and the right to education, Article 26. It's also the constitutional commitment to the free exchange of ideas and knowledge to support sharing of knowledge using technologies. This is particular, though written in the 1940s, it's extremely relevant today as we speak about open education resources, which has only been in existence since the turn of this millennium. What's a recommendation? UNESCO has adopted a, uni an a recommendation on open educational resources, and a recommendation in short is what it's the word semantically. It recommends that member states take a certain number of actions in a specific area. And while it is the word recommendation semantically is not very strong in terms of a normative instrument, it is one of the strongest normative instruments in the UN, in the UNESCO. Whoops. Uh, this process is the screen that you see that's colored in yellow and has a little halo around it is when member states, 193 member states agreed in the first instance to move forward with the development of a recommendation and in the second instance that they adopted by consensus this, this document. The category two meeting is the moment in which the text was agreed upon down to the last comma um, by the member states and their nominated uh, representatives with the, uh, and at this time we also had observers from civil society. So um, this is an instrument that's agreed upon internationally. And this is another, the two other instances are when member states have officially agreed upon this. And the pink ones signify moments in which the text was developed. And you'll see, as some of you have been there, it was the Second World OER Congress in Slovenia played an important role. So what's the recommendation? Looks like this. And it's one of 12 recommendations adopted since 1989. So it is a very important document and it's available. You can go into Google, Legal Instruments, UNESCO OER recommendation, and you'll get it in the six UN languages. So the recommendation, what's interesting about it is that there is a rec there's a definition of what OER is. And this is particularly important today because um, there has been a lot of talk about free resources and free is not an OER. A free resource is not necessarily an OER. An OER is an open edu is an educational resource which is available on an open license to 
that allows for no use, no, I'm sorry, no cost access, reuse, repurpose, and adaptation and redistribution by others. There is a definition of open license as it refers to, uh, it outlines what we mean by open license. And right now, I think it's really very, very significant because it's, uh, the lines are getting blurred a little bit between what has been offered for free by certain entities and what is actually an open educational resource. These are the stakeholders that are part of this, um, of this uh, that are recognized in the recommendation. What I'd like you to recognize is that there is a very long list and it is very diverse. And it's really important that it's so long and it's so diverse because it outlines the fact that open educational resources are of value to a large community of people in terms of the, um, and it requires a large community of people to thrive in terms of being effective tools for knowledge sharing. And in this list, we have the educational stakeholders, of course, educational providers, educators, leaders, governmental bodies, parents, etc. But we also have cultural institutions such as libraries, archives and museums and their users. And of course, ICT technology professionals, student associations, publishers, authors, medias, broadcasting groups and funding bodies. So what have we done with this? Well, this is what's inside it already. We have five areas. The first one is that what came across is that a lot of people think that OER is a great idea. Actually, I've never met anyone who said it wasn't a great idea, but a lot of people don't know how to actually use OER to access them, adopt them, redistribute them technically in terms of the licensing, in terms of actually doing it, using it, sharing it. Second part is policy. How do you ensure policy that is supportive of the, uh, of it? of OER, and third of all, issues related to equitable access for persons with disabilities or vulnerable groups, and of course, quality assurance. The fourth one is on sustainability models. If you have resources which are available free and legally, then how do you maintain the sustainability element? What are some of the strategies? The fifth one is on international cooperation. So what have we done with all this? Well, we developed the Dynamic OER Coalition, which was launched a year ago, almost exactly day for day. And this is a mechanism to support the implementation of the, re of the recommendation by leveraging regional collaborative networks, supporting the creation of communities of practice, establishing partnerships and, and resource mobilization. And examples of this are translations, uh, leveraging international initiatives, et cetera. Concretely, this is what we've done since we launched. We have in this area, in terms of capacity building, we have started a mapping of OER capacity building courses everywhere. What we found during our discussions is that there are a lot of different courses out there, but we're not quite sure. People are not aware of everything that's happening out there and where it is and where the links are and what's happening. These are courses about how to make OER. That's what we're looking at. We're supporting regional policy development activities in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we're about to launch something in the Caribbean region for small island developing states. We're developing a checklist on using open solutions to ensure accessibility for persons with disabilities to open and distance learning. Open solutions is, uh, includes open educational resources. It's, uh, it's uh, OER, FOSS, and uh, open access to scientific information. And we're supporting the French translation and contextualization of a course done by the Open OERU, which is in New Zealand, into French. I'm working with ICDE and with uh, the Université Virtual uh, Numérique on this. And we're supporting the ICT CFD Harnessing OER Network, which supports synergies and partnerships between teacher training institutions globally. And now this one is a different color and it's for a reason because we would like to call upon, this is an open invitation to actually contribute to this. Um, I put up this, uh, this one, it's linked to the capacity building and we're doing a survey right now. And my colleague Eleni, who's, uh, who's uh, on this call is the contact person. You have her email here. If you would like to access the survey, which I don't think you could write down if you wanted to, because it's a little bit hard to, it's a strange address. Please do contact Eleni and she will 
uh, she will provide you with further information. The, we're doing a survey on existing open educational resources capacity building courses worldwide. So please, this is an open invitation. And with that, there's one last point that I have, which is on what uh, we did about a year ago, was a call for to support learning and knowledge sharing through OER. And it was, um, it's important a year ago, and it's important today. A year ago when we did it, it was when the pandemic started and we didn't know that it would go on this long. And uh, now it's still going on, but there will be a future after this. And so this calls for joint action to integrate open educational resources and open educational practices to uh, systematically to increase knowledge sharing for the post COVID-19 future of learning and for now. So with that, I'd like to thank you. My email is here and uh, thank you very much. And I think we have a very large lineup now who's of different colleagues who are going to speak about other activities that are being done worldwide on what's uh, what is be, uh, on issues related to the recommendation. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing my screen. So I said to, do you want to take the floor? Oui, oui. Merci beaucoup à Zainab pour cette présentation. De Thank la... you so much, Zainab, for presenting the UNESCO recommendation on OERs um, and uh, the uh, content uh, of the recommendation. We're going to move straight into our presentations, starting with uh, Dr. Cable Green, who will be focusing on the impact and relevance of the UNESCO recommendation on OERs with respect to open licensing and open resources. Dr. Cable Green is in charge of open resources at the Creative Commons. As you know, this is a global NGO, uh, which is uh, focused on sharing of information and culture to take up the key challenges of the world. Mr. Cable Green, you have the floor. Okay, for me to yes. jump in? All right, yes, thank you. you. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I, I have a few remarks. I'm going to keep them short. I'm eager to get to the uh, panel discussion later. Uh, it, it's been my privilege to work with uh, the UNESCO recommendation on OER since its inception. And I'm really honored to continue to work with UNESCO now on the implementation phase through the OER Dynamic Coalition. Uh, I'm with Creative Commons. Uh, I'm the Director of Open Education and Creative Commons licenses put the open in, uh, in OER. As Zainab said, uh, OER are not just materials that are free, they're materials that are free uh, and you have legal rights for your learning environments. So OER are either openly licensed or they're in the public domain. And it's this open licensing which empowers us all to legally share our knowledge and to reuse, revise, remix, uh, and share others' educational resources. I think the impact around the recommendation on open education and education more broadly has the potential to be profound. The recommendation is a guide, a set of specific actions that governments can take to advance universal access to knowledge in furtherance of fundamental human rights. When governments and education institutions implement the recommendation, open education increasingly becomes the default and the world moves closer to reaching fundamental human rights exemplified in SDG 4 and Article 26 of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right to an education. So what does this process look like as governments begin to implement the recommendation? What does progress look like? Resources on how to implement the recommendation will be created and openly published. We will have handouts on the benefits of OER, templates for open education and licensing policies, slide decks, case studies, research, stories of transformation, open policy and procurement guides, videos on all of these topics, FAQs, blog posts, and more. National governments and education institutions 
will begin to implement sections of the recommendation and will seek assistance uh, from one another and from civil society to work on more of the recommendation. Educators, government staff, librarians, and others will be empowered through in-depth capacity building activities to help them navigate the legal, technical, and practical aspects of opening up knowledge. Governments, education institutions, educators, learners, and others will be equipped to make the knowledge they build and steward openly accessible in the public interest in an ethical, sustainable, and equitable way. Creative Commons has worked with UNESCO for almost 20 years now on open education, and this recommendation provides the framework to guide our work into the future. Creative Commons has prioritized this work in our strategic planning, and we're really looking forward to working with UNESCO, its member states, and civil society to support widespread implementation of this critical work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Green, for this presentation. We're going to move now to the next speaker, Dr. Jehan Osman. Dr. Osman is an associate professor in educational technologies at the Comparative Education Center amongst others at the University, American University of Cairo. She holds a doctorate in uh, educational technology from uh, Bloomington, Indiana, and a master's degree from the American University of Cairo and a BA in English from the University of Alexandria. She's going to be focusing on the implementation of open educational resources um, in ICTs. Dr. Osman. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, delighted to be with you all. Uh, some old friends and uh, some new collaborators, we hope. Um, I'll be uh, very briefly talking about our experience at uh, AUC uh, in uh, integrating the ICT CFT and um, making that available so, through an open course. Um, could someone please uh, pull up the, the PowerPoint? Okay. Um, so uh, it might be important just to say that uh, uh, although a school of education exists at AUC, which is a private university, our university is not a major uh, teacher preparation program. Uh, but we've been, we worked with the UNESCO regional office in Cairo in creating that open course, depending on uh, materials that already existed in the OER hub uh, created by UNESCO and curating um, other materials for teacher development um, throughout many countries in Africa, Asia, and elsewhere. Um, could you please the next slide? Uh, and so uh, our main, uh, so we started with uh, creating that course and our main activities for that time was really reviewing and updating uh, the Kenyan OER course and contextualizing it uh, to the Egyptian context. We also um, Arabized it and, um, and tried to find more local content uh, to, um, update that, um, we had to orient different stakeholders who took part in our uh, project about what OERs are and what open education is because uh, when that course, was, when we started working on that course in 2018, the concept was very new. And then we implemented the course with public school teachers in Egypt and um, evaluated that experience. And uh, we wrote a couple of, um, uh, pieces to kind of share the lessons we learned from that. Um, next slide, please. So um, we started with orienting different stakeholders in the ministry and in public uh, schools uh, through an OER workshop uh, to identify, you know, to, to kind of acquaint them to what that is. Uh, next slide, please. And that was at the American University 
in 2018. And uh, the panelists or those who helped us uh, do this orientation were really a mix of um, uh, like um, people interested in OER and ICFT uh, from Greece, Lebanon, Egypt, and, uh, uh, and Jordan. Next slide, please. And um, the aims of that workshop was raising of awareness, giving uh, teachers a voice and a sense of agency, uh, giving them hand-on training on how to find and adapt OERs and building enthusiasm and community. And um, next slide, please. So that was, uh, these were the workshops. This is where it took place. Next slide. And uh, we had kind of like a, a good mix between, you know, male and female teachers, different years of experience. But of course, um, uh, the majority of our teachers were uh, with over 20 years of experience. Next slide, please. That was very important for us since they support younger teachers. Um, so we enhanced knowledge in different areas of OER and, um, and this helped uh, create a community, uh, a WhatsApp group that is still uh, active today among those teachers and workshop attendees. Next slide, please. And um, that was, um, yeah, and so there was interest in knowing more about OER and expressed uh, interest in becoming trainers and advocates. Next slide, please. And after that, we actually uh, implemented our, uh, our full-fledged course in, in uh, ICT-CFT uh, framework and its uh, integration tools. Uh, with public school teachers, and these were our first graduates. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we were happy that because the course was blended, that we were able to reach um, more female teachers and teachers from uh, farther away governorates like the Red Sea governorate. So here we have a STEM teacher, female STEM teacher, uh, from Hagara. Next slide, please. Um, and so there were quite a bit of challenges. Some were general challenges relating to uh, finding OER, um, cutting edge Arab content, finding open content, and finding contextualized materials and data. Uh, that was a general challenge. And then we had a lot of more specific institutional challenges. Next slide, please. Uh, just the idea of open content was very alien at that time. Uh, conceptually, um, very few people understood it, and very few people saw any um, any importance to it. And that was partially, of course, because this is a private university, where some of where there are a lot of other issues related to copyright and. And yeah, there, it, it, it interacts and conflicts with many other uh, concepts and ideas. Um, and then also technically, the idea of um, technically open, opening up the infrastructure for people external to the university to have access to knowledge uh, that is on university servers. So that, is, uh, that was another change. Um, uh, and of course, finding all the time, like it was a challenge to find support uh, in terms of finances or time uh, to, uh, to establish that course and to sustain it. Uh, and this really shows how difficult um, it, it was to introduce the idea of open educational resources uh, within the institutional, uh, at the institutional level. Um, next slide, slide please. Uh, but uh, we were able to use uh, materials from the OER hub uh, created by UNESCO and we uploaded our course to the hub. Um, we are still, uh, this course was 
pre version three and we have not integrated it yet, uh, but uh, we'll hopefully will in the very near future. Next slide, please. And yeah, so our plan is to further expand on the idea of use, using open resources at the institutional level and beyond uh, and promoting more OERs and uh, teacher professional development uh, based on openness. Um, I think that'll be all for now and I'll leave the rest uh, for questions later on. Thank you very much to Mrs. Osman for this presentation. We're now going to move on to the fourth presentation of this webinar. Mr. Colin from Iguera will tell us about uh, the organization of uh, uh, OEG Global. Mr. Uh, Colin is a teacher at the University of Nantes. He was involved uh, in a number of research themes, in particular on algorithms, the theory of uh, uh, formal language and uh, uh, shape recognition. He's uh, very interested in the area of uh, grammatical uh, interference, and he's the author of more than 50 articles on this particular point, uh, as well as of a monograph that was published in 2010. And he's also published a, a book called Grammatical Interference, Computational Linguistics. He's uh, uh, also served the community as the chairman of conferences, expert and uh, reviewer. And he has co-organized a number of workshops and tutorials. So, Mr. Colin, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? And can you all see my slides? Yes. Let's say that silence means consent. So I'm delighted to be with you. I'm uh, delighted to take the floor after a number of people who uh, have already explained uh, what uh, uh, OER is about and how important it is. Uh, and uh, uh, concrete cases uh, uh, of uh, organization of these OERs. I'm also going to be very concrete because I'm going to tell you about something that's taking place now, the preparation, namely, of the next uh, Conference of Open Education Global, which will take place in Nantes in the coming weeks. So the work that I'm going to present now is a collaborative work uh, with colleagues from Nantes, but also people from Open Education Global more generally. So, something a little bit personal to explain the situation the way I see it. When people ask me the question, okay, you have convinced me open education is a wonderful idea, what is it that, we should, that I should do? Very often my answer is, okay, we have to succeed with two uh, approaches at the same time, a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. The top-down approach is to generate the context to be able to share in universities, trying to convince uh, the, the dean and the teams of the dean to encourage uh, teachers to do this. And for me, this is the role of the dynamic coalition to look into this top-down approach and to uh, uh, work to see how we can uh, convince everybody. But top down, the top-down approach is not enough. You also have to have a bottom-up approach. Okay, saying, okay, there are many, many things that are happening in the field. Uh, the teacher, uh, because of his very nature, wants to share things. So that's his primary role, to share knowledge. And the reason that uh, why he can do it sometimes is because there are obstacles, but he really wants to do it. And so there are things happening in the field, and we have to really uh, f um, report on these things. And this is where uh, education, uh, Open Education Global does wonderful work uh, with reports, with presentations, wonderful presentations every year which really show that uh, everywhere in the world people are conducting experiments uh, with uh, things that are very so very sophisticated sometimes because sometimes you have people with uh, more than 10 or 15 years of experience and sometimes it's more recent and so that's uh, the objective through the conference uh, of uh, uh, really reporting on these two worlds uh, and i'm sure that the people in the dynamic coalition will say that they're also very much bottom up but and, and same 
same thing for the open education global people who also want to play a top-down role. So maybe my vision is somewhat simplified, but I think that it really uh, explains things a bit. Now, what is uh, the Open Education Global Conference? Well, it's a wonderful conference, which now for years has brought people together over several days everywhere in the world. Um, uh, uh, in turn, uh, this year for the first time, it will be in a French-speaking country, but uh, all continents uh, actually hosted the conference uh, one after the other. In 2020, uh, of course, the conference was 100% virtual with over 700 people who enrolled, uh, more than 270 speakers and 183 sessions. So lots of materials and lots of exchanges. In 2020, one, uh, we are fortunate uh, uh, to be able to organize this in Nantes with the Dean of the Nantes University who agreed to be the co-chair. This is something that's really important because it means that in France, uh, a big academic institution really brings to bear its political weight uh, on this particular cause, which is very, very good. Another institution also, which will bring in uh, uh, weight to this uh, event is UNESCO. Uh, and this is something that's really important for us because it will legitimize the fact that the conference can actually really move to this top-down approach that I described before. This will be um, a, a blended uh, conference. In other words, there will be an inline part, and hopefully, uh, we all hope so, we're going to have a face-to-face -face part as well. The uh, um, virtual part will take place in uh, September and October, and uh, the face-to-face uh, the, um, -face part uh, will take place from the 5th to the 7th of October in Nantes. There be This all, will all be explained on the site, of course. And so the people with whom we work uh, at uh, Open Education Global have said, okay, now that UNESCO wants to support us, uh, let's also support UNESCO. So how can we support UNESCO? Well, actually, we can uh, support uh, the uh, approach adopted by the Dynamic Coalition and say, okay, we are here to get the various messages across and to also tell you about in the field, uh, on the field experience that support these messages. So this is our uh, objective to report for those uh, during those four weeks of uh, online activity to report on examples throughout the world, discuss these examples with people from the Dynamic Coalition in not then face to face from the 5th to the 7th of, of October. Now, these are uh, objectives which are my take uh, of it. So we have an, an international objective, which is to contribute to the implementation of uh, UNESCO's uh, recommendation. So this is uh, uh, what uh, Cable Green said. We are here to get the message across to make sure that this recommendation applies in as many countries as possible. As far as France is concerned and the French-speaking countries uh, uh, are concerned, we also have an objective. France is, is different. Uh, I think that normally we say Spain is different, but France is different as well, and we have special objectives, and we're going to take advantage of the fact that this is the first time that we have the conference in France. We're not going to do something completely different. We're not going to have a French-style OERs, not at all. We want to share uh, with our practices. And then uh, Nantes is a very beautiful university town, and uh, the university uh, chose everything that's open as the, the the red thread uh, of uh, its uh, policy, so it will be a good way to progress as well. So then we have a number of specific objectives. Multilingualism is the first thing. I'm currently making my presentation in French, and I saw in our exchanges that the uh, Spaniards uh, regretted that we didn't have uh, Spanish subtitles. So when we're talking about global, uh, we're really talking about global, but for a number of uh, reasons uh, so far, uh, the financial historic reasons, uh, the conference took place only in English. This year, we want the, the conference to take place in the six UN languages. In other words, everyone will be able to share in the reflection in his or her own language. And this will be made possible through the webinars, and we're trying to look for ways to allow this to happen also 
in the face-to-face -face meetings. Of course, we have to be reasonable. We, we don't have that many, uh, we're not going to have interpreters teams to have uh, an interpretation for six weeks, but we have the uh, ability to use the digital tools to do this. We want to integrate the French speaking community more and uh, uh, I'm a UNESCO chair, uh, and contrary to others who are looking into social sciences, I'm a scientist, I, I'm an IT specialist, and I believe that artificial intelligence should help us solve problems. And here again, I would like to invite uh, uh, artificial intelligence uh, researchers to come and help us. And this is one of the objectives of the conference. So uh, we are launching a call to contribution. Uh, th this is going to be published very soon. We have the call for the conference already, but the call to contributions will take place uh, in a few days' time. And uh, we call on everyone from France, from the world of French-speaking countries, but everyone else as well outside of France, uh, the various players in uh, documentation, uh, libraries, and so on. I wrote to the various uh, local and national authorities. I talked to uh, education, uh, educational players. I talked to publishers. How can we get publishers around the table? That's that's a very good question. We, we hope that they'll be here. So uh, if you want to help us, help us in participating in the webinar, because this will be what we'll be able to exchange upstream and uh, take a, a role in the webinars, organize webinars, or um, uh, agree to be a rapporteur, come to Nantes, uh, organize a session, organize a roundtable, participate in a session or a roundtable. And uh, also, of course, uh, any attempt to uh, provide us uh, some financial uh, backup uh, will be uh, welcome. So, thank you very much. Uh, I will leave it at that. And of course, I'm quite prepared to answer questions uh, afterwards. And I'm very, very proud to be able to work with wonderful people on this great project. Thank you very much to all. Thank you very much, Mr. Colin for all of this information that you shared with us on this uh, uh, conference. We have now come to the very last presentation of this webinar. This will be dealing with a project which is called CREA. And this presentation will be made by Mr. Miguel Angen uh, Pereira, who is a 48-year-old uh, Spanish teacher. He worked for 10 years at the uh, National uh, Development Center. He then joined uh, the uh, uh, department in the uh, Extremadura uh, the Ministry for Education. And, and now he's uh, uh, working on the development of uh, OER in Extremadura. He also develops his own OERs. He participates in a number of training uh, initiatives, support to, to teachers, and he participates uh, in projects related to new ways of learning, like the uh, uh, project-based learning uh, project. So, m m Mr. Pereira, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, well, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I think in some way I'm the new guy so for me, it's a real pleasure to share the floor with this uh, amazing group. Greetings from Extremadura. As you know, uh, and as you can see at the slide, Extremadura is a little uh, region in the southwest of Spain, very, very close to the Portugal border. So it's from that place that we are talking to you uh, in this day. Uh, of course, I want to thank you to, to UNESCO for giving us the chance, the opportunity to, say, to share our CEA project, CREA project, in this event and in the Open Week 2021. As it was said, I am Miguel Angel Pereira, difficult to say for some people, especially in English. So, uh, Miguel, it's enough. At this time, I'm a member of the Extremadura's uh, Ministry of Education. As you know, Spain has a specific system that makes that the region can uh, take their own decision about some, some policies, like education, for instance. So I'm working at the Extremadura's Ministry of Education. Uh, we have been working in open educational resources field from the year 2017. 
exactly from the year that we came back from Slovenia. Um, obviously, it's, for that, it's a real pleasure to be here, to be part of this webinar and share with you our experience. How we have put on the ground the OER recommendations and the OER policies. Uh, as you can see in the present slide, uh, CREA, C -E 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 is the acronym for creation and application of open educational resources. Um, I would like to note that CREA is not only a project or a program, but a strategy, a policy, a complete policy of our government focused on the goal of making OER an essential part of our educational system. As maybe some of you know, Extremadura, I have said in the southwest of Spain, uh, has the worst levels of development, not only in Spain, but in, in all the European Union. So for us, uh, OER policies and OER strategic are a opportunity, and we consider OER essential to improve our educational model. Um, our CEL project that we are presenting now start four years ago, as I mentioned, from 2017. And in this time, I think we have helped and encouraged teachers to use and to create OER. Uh, the results is in this slide. As you can see, we have published, published more than 300 OER days in our official uh, repository. And um, we have made all these development aligned with the UNESCO recommendations in the five areas. Now we are gonna make a little review about the way we are running these five recommendations on the ground in our, in our educational ground. Um, we start with the first area, the UNESCO, uh, building capacity to stakeholders to create, access, reuse, adapt, and redistribute OER, and we make this in two ways. First of all, we give all our teachers tools, free tools to use, uh, adapt, create, and of course, share with their students uh, open educational resources. And at the same time, we work with our teachers, giving them a permanent training. We have a specific uh, support team, uh, part of the Extremadura's Ministry of Education, that is always available to give uh, teachers support, guides, and to include their recommendations, their ideas in our process to create and, and make the development of different uh, creator tools. Two principal, first of one, EXE Learning, maybe one of you in this uh, international tool, and our specific but free Scholarium Creator tool. Um, obviously, we have been clear from 2017 that technological tools are important, are very important for the teachers, but are not enough to ensure that the, the, um, we give them the enough skills to work with all year. So our idea is um, connecting us with the second area, developing uh, supportive policies. Uh, for a teacher, for we call CREA teachers, the professional development working with OER is guaranteed. Um, they can uh, guarantee this development, professional development in the OER field, working in two ways, creating OER or uh, applying, using, making the experiences with the OER there or another maids have uh, created. You have in this slide that um, to improve this way, every teacher has a, a personal mentor to guide him or her in the way of OER. Um, we see that encourage, um, motivate teachers in the use of OER is essential to keep our teachers involved in Korea. You say, uh, this year, for after we start with work, uh, working in our CREA project, more than 75% of our teachers, our CREA teachers, came involved in the project. Four years before, four years after, sorry, they keep creating, they keep using, they keep adapting, of course. 
Uh, of course, uh, creating OER is easy, but for us, in our experience, the complicated thing is uh, to change the way the teachers and even the students think and use OER. Um, in our project, in Kiria project, OER is, of, our, of, of course, absolutely open to all the teachers. Uh, from Extremadura, Extremadura, from other regions, we have people using OER from Colombia, Argentina, Mexico, and other South American countries. Of, and of course, any of them from Extremadura, out of Extremadura, and even out of, of Spain, can, <coughs> sorry, can adapt, use, and modify this OER published by, by our project. Okay? So, um, in addition, and connected with the encouraging and inclusive and equitable quality OER. We work with the reference framework of the UDL. As you, as you know, that means the universal design for learning and all, all our teachers creating or even using the OER have to follow, this guy have to follow this framework, okay? And at the same time, we collaborate with several uh, private and public public institutions to improve the accessibility of our technological tools. Uh, at this point, the goal is to ensure that all our work, all our contribution contributes to give education a complete inclusive perspective. Um, finally, we can affirm that CRIA, our CRIA project, remember a project developed in a uh, southwest region of Spain with uh, worse levels of uh, development all around Europe. It is sustainable project because it's supported by teachers and supported by our official politica, our official policy, and is linked with international projects. As I mentioned before, we have been collaborating with people uh, at Colombia, to Uruguay, South America, and these people are using, but also creating OER, um, OER for our project. However, as I said before, the key for, it, for, this, uh, for this, um, this part or this uh, sustainable uh, needing is supporting and helping teachers in everything they need to create OER. That has been our, our work, our goal from the beginning, to make sure that any teacher using OER from the CRIA project has uh, enough support to create, to use, to adapt, to know about the tools they have to use, and of course, to share their creation with other teachers. This point, helping teachers, supporting teachers, will ensure that CRIA continues for many years. We have been very successful in these four years, and we're hoping to, to be successful during the, four, the next four, eight, or 12 years. On the other hand, of course, we are absolutely open to cooperation and collaboration. And obviously, I would love, I would like to invite you to visit the official web page repository you have in the, in the slide, in the bottom side of the slide, with a, a direct link. And I think it's the best way to know what we are doing and we are, what we are going to do during the next uh, year. So we have finished our presentation. It has been obviously a brief view of the CREA CREA project. Um, thanks again to all the people that is making this webinar possible. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to all the team that is working in Extremadura to make CREA project. And of course, uh, we wait you at the Extremadura CREA project. Uh, be part of our OER repository, be part of our project. And that's all. We team from Extremadura, thank you so much. And I hope I can keep, uh, can share with you more, sp more spaces like this. Thank you. I see the, some very interesting questions coming up in the chat and the Q&A. Uh, so uh, one is from uh, Richard Rogers to panelists. How can librarians in small island developing states influence OER policy development? Uh, 
does someone want to answer? I can say just a few things to start us off. Um, librarians increasingly are critical players on uh, college and university and school campuses. Um, librarians tend to be, before any open education training or before any open licensing training, librarians tend to be uh, the best at understanding uh, copyright, at understanding the fundamentals of sharing, at understanding the importance of, uh, of retaining and keeping a copy, uh, and really understanding the core uh, principles behind uh, the importance of access to knowledge and resources. And so uh, when librarians first learn about open education, it they say, well, of course, <laughs> of course, that's the way it should be. And so uh, they tend to be leaders on their, uh, on their campus. Uh, increasingly, we see roles like OER librarian, at a university or a college, and um, they're really uh, pivotal players. So my, my answer would be that whatever policy you're considering at your institution, uh, I would make sure to include the librarians uh, in that. Um, they are probably some of the best experts you have on campus. Please, uh, Yes, I... I second what uh, Cable says, and I agree with it fully. I think librarians are really the unsung heroes of uh, OER. And I think one, strategically, one area that would be helpful perhaps for them to be able to come forward a bit more and to be recognized for the important role they play is if there would be a ways to have some sort of, to bring together the different stakeholders. And the stakeholders that speak the most on this area are from the education sector. So to, um, to approach, to, to bring closer the librarians and the education sector together. And there are debates going on on open educational resources in SIDS, um, particularly if the colleague would like to reach out to me, they were going to be launching some work in the Caribbean and we can make sure that we include the librarian community. My email I'll put into the chat, so please do, um, please do reach out to me and I can actually help you to get in, involved in the debates. But the, I would encourage that there is, they, reach out that the community, that there's an interaction between the librarians and the educational community that's much closer in terms of the OER work. Thank you, Jeanne. Uh, Colin? Oui, avec, uh, bon, je suis tout à fait d'accord. Yes, I fully agree. But uh, I, I feel strange speaking French, but uh, uh, I play with by the rules of the game since we have translation. But there's a, really a challenge for uh, um, uh, librarians uh, and documentalists that we saw in a recent discussion. But it's uh, okay. We we agree to share knowledge. Uh, with the point where we have some difficulty it has to do with the uh, principle of. Uh, revision. In other words, a, a, a librarian doesn't like us uh, to uh, take a book and, ch and ch change the uh, the uh, sequence of the pages or change the content. So this is a change to a uh, work. Uh, uh, but uh, somewhere in OER, uh, the idea is uh, that we want the work to continue living. It's not the traditional idea of a library, for instance, you see. Uh, and so maybe I'm wrong and maybe the thought has evolved on this, but here I think that something has to change because we really need to convince lots of people on this change of paradigm that uh, namely when you prepare a, a class, uh, you have to be able to change your, the, the course, you have to be uh, uh, able to improve it uh, whilst uh, still respecting someone else. Thank you, Colin. Another question regarding the Open Education uh, Global Conference in Nantes. Vincent is asking, who is the target audience? Well, everybody, of course. In fact, still with this uh, top-down and bottom-up principle that I described, during the first four weeks, uh, we're going to have some webinars. So, these will be things where 
we realize that wherever you sleep on the planet, you don't sleep at the same time, you, you don't speak the same language, you don't necessarily have the same cultural references. So we're going to have webinars that are going to be positioned geographically using different languages as well. So as to allow all of the practitioners to give us some feedback on what is happening in the field, whether these are positive or negative experiences, we're going to have a rapporteur based system so that this information, which is really vital and essential to be able to analyze things uh, are, is fed back to us. So the practitioner part is really the webinar part. Then we're going to have a second part, which is the face-to-face -face meeting in Nantes, where we're going to have to analyze the feedback from these webinars. We're going to have to analyze the feedback or the work of UNESCO and of the uh, Dynamic uh, Alliance. Uh, the, the dynamic coalition, sorry. We're going to have to analyze where we stand. We're going to need to have uh, people who are closer to the decision makers to uh, be able to come up with recommendations, uh, not like the 2019 recommendation, but recommendations as to what it is that works and in what context it works. So roughly speaking, we have the various players of uh, open education, which at the various levels will be able to find things that are, that are of interest to them. Thank you, Colin. Another question to all panelists uh, from Alexander Enkerly. It sounds like a lot of the OER effort is on the production side. Are some regions more active in providing support funding, training, professional rewards in adopting and adapting OER? In other words, are there inequalities in supply and demand? Well, uh, I, can, I can talk about the, um, the Extremadura's way of, of work. And I have presented, I have made it that during the presentation, we are working not only in the production of OER, but also in giving some teachers the support, even in their professional career, to use those uh, OER. So uh, I think that the, the way that many some regions are adapting is giving the, the teachers in one of the two ways, creating or, or, or using, adapting, the same, the same rewards in their professional career, in, and that's our way. Even there's, there are some regions, I, I can't mention a specific name because I, I don't have the, um, the knowledge, that, that are, are giving them some economical uh, rewards for the creation, but not now for the, for the experience of, of using that OIR. So this could be a good way, but it's a difficult way for, because obviously the public funds are limited. So um, like what I wanted to say that our experience is that one way is giving uh, teachers uh, making experiences with the OER the same privileges and the same rewards that teachers creating OER, sorry. Thank you, Miguel Angel. Uh, another question from Vincent. Uh, what should be done to help teachers in developing countries to produce and share their OERs? Who would like to take the floor? Um, I, I could take it. Um, I mean, uh, I, think, um, I think one major um, uh, issue is always the policies uh, that support teachers in uh, creating and using OERs. And uh, if uh, policies are not supportive of that, uh, teachers are less likely to consider OERs as an alternative. Uh, at least this is what we've noticed um, with teachers in Egypt, and I think it would probably be the case in, in many different countries. Um, and so it's very similar to what Miguel was talking about, like our teachers supported in terms of getting credit for, for OER, um, our teachers um, uh, rewarded for that, uh, are they encouraged to use that in their classroom or are they not so so this whole dynamic uh, is probably a policy matter at some level but also on a different level it's uh, capacity building related to um, you know whether they know uh, what OERs are and know how to create them and adapt them and, uh, and share them and so I, um, I think uh, there are some basic concerns at uh, this level 
Um, um, to me, these are the two major elements, but I'm sure that some of my colleagues might have additional answers for that. I would, I would like to add another suggestion. We have talked at the beginning of our presentation about uh, specific tools. In our experience, it's very important. If, you, if we gave them some, we give them some tools for creating and adapting open educational resources. At this time, we can use in, in many other devices, our personal computers, some school computers. That could be a, a, a very, a very a, a good way to improve the, the using and creation of, of OER in our teachers. If they have very clear which is the tool they have to use and they have guides and maybe people guiding them to use the, those tools, that could be a good way. And of course, there is another idea, the connection with other teachers in other countries uh, making the same thing, having some reference could be a good way to, to improve their their, their desire to, 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 be, to get into the OIR world. Thank you, Miguel Angel. Uh, there are no open questions left. So, Zeynep, you have the floor for the closing remarks. Yes, thank you very much, Irene. Thank you very much to our panelists, to uh, Colin de la Hegra, Cable Green, Jihan Osman, Miguel Angel Pereira, and uh, for your very valuable inputs. Thank you to Eleni and Isatu, and Eleni Borsino and Isatu Dabo for your uh, very able handling of the session. Um, it is a great honor, and thank you to, your, to the participants for your time and your very valuable questions and the debates that we, the discussions that we have had over this period. Um, uh, we would like to invite you to stay involved. Uh, if you would like to uh, be part, receive information about the OER Dynamic Coalition, we'll send you a form that you can fill out if you're not already part of the mailing list in order to become a, a part of the, um, of the, the mailing list to receive information on what we're doing and upcoming events. And um, thank you again for your time and wishing you a very happy Open Education Week and uh, a very nice continuation for your afternoon. Thanks very much. And thank you also to the technicians and to the our technician Anna and our technician in room six and also of course to our very, very valuable um, interpreters who were able to make this session bilingual. Thank you.